Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I am unboxing Machina Arcana 2.5 edition. Sort of. Something like that. You see, Machina Arcana, which has an original edition, a second edition, and then a slightly streamlined added an expansion, I believe. We have uh, Beyond, I believe, was added. Uh, we have some stuff. Or is it Two Eternity? I don't remember which one was added. We had some stuff added to this game. Machina Arcana, second and a half edition, plus expansions, unboxing, and rambling. Let's call it that. Coffee shot as usual. We got my latte. Which is delicious, but has to be sipped. You see, when I used to do this with cold brew, I could take that little sip faster. Now I gotta be careful because it's actually hot. Although the reason it's hot is because the basement is cold and I'd like some, well, temperature modulation and all that. So, Machina Arcana, second edition. This is an unboxing and rambling. Typical disclaimer because every single time I do one of these things, I get at least one person who's like, why are you talking about all these other random things, bro? Like, you know, just talk about the game. That's all we're here for. And I'm like, fine. But I warned you in the first 30 seconds that... Whatever happens, happens. Sometimes that means that I will primarily talk about the game. Other times it means that I will talk about whatever comes to mind. It is basically just... I mean, the game's in front of me. That's the good news. Which means inherently, to some degree, the game will be talked about because it is present, it is on my mind. But not always this. In fact, sometimes I talk about other games. Sometimes I talk about how my day's been going. By the way, my day's been going fantastic. I have mined MGMT set up on the table. I have played a few games of it. Hope to be playing some more of it. Fantastic experience. I assume this unboxing goes up after my review. I don't know for sure. We can figure that out later. Either way, this is Machina Arcana, second and a half edition, plus expansions. That's not going to be the title. That would be a way too long title. Now, I've played this game, so I already know how to play all that. But these are the newer rules, which, fun fact, I've never actually read the original second edition rules. Because when I got the second edition, I wanted to play it with whatever clean, streamlined version of the rules they had. And so I downloaded PDFs, or whatever, paper thingies, of the new rules, so I've only played with the third edition rules, but my second edition copy. By the way, second edition copy, right there behind me-ish over here, because I haven't gotten rid of it yet, although you can expect to see that in one of my games leaving the collection videos. Now, remember, Machina Arcana is a game that I highly, highly recommend. This is, I mean, this this is just, it's a good, it's a, I don't know, I'm just here for stuff, monster behavior, rules, and fun, fun fact, I've never finished the rules for Machina Arcana, which is probably a problem. I mean, if you think about it, I've reviewed this game, I've played this game, I've talked about this game, I'm unboxing this game, I've played this game, I don't know how many times, but enough times that you think I should read the rule book, but I never actually finished them because of this guidebook. Read this first. Fun fact, by the way, uh, in general, if you're going to say read this first, why don't you put that on top instead of it below? But read this first is true. You see, this guidebook over here basically guides you through a few sample turns. It's the first thing I did when playing Machina Arcana, and as a result of that, I was able to dive into it. So literally just walking you through characters, taking their turns, saying what they're doing, round one, round two. It reads like a story. You'd have to be a little diligent about it, but it reads like a story. It's not a good rule book, but it gives you a good guidance into the rules. And for me, between finishing the guidebook, which is like 20 pages, something like that, like here we go, 23 pages, Finishing the guidebook gave me enough of an overview of what the game is that I have since referenced the rules, and that is it. This is what we have here, and we have these individual player aid sheets, just a little thin paper. They do the job, they're, but they're, they're thin. They're not like, you know, some heavy cardstock player aid, so these are okay, you know, but they're not, not overly impressed there. But then we have the tokens and the artwork. Now, Machina Arcana is a dungeon-crawling experience, although it's a dungeon-crawling... I'm missing tokens! No! No! I'm missing some tokens. I assume they're in the box somewhere. But, oh, here we go. Here's one of them. There we go. Panic averted. We got the tokens. We got the tokens. For a second there, I was really worried. I was not really worried, for context. But, this is just how punch boards work when you get them. Now, Machina Arcana, by the way, this copy is an early pre-production factory cop copy, which means they basically sent this over. But, the factory is going through production. We have our little tiles here. Let me go ahead and start moving things off to the side. We have our little tiles. Awesome. I'm going to take a sip, because it's been a while. Here's a little character tile. But Machina Arcana is a game that does not have miniatures and does, to a certain extent, I was resistant to it because, here's my logic. Bear with me on the logic, because I'm never going to say no to a game without miniatures because it doesn't have miniatures on its own, as evidenced by the fact that I own Machina Arcana, love Machina Arcana, and highly recommend Machina Arcana. But where we do lie, oh, this is beautiful. These are tiles. Tiles! I'm excited. See, this game has gorgeous art. No miniatures, true, but gorgeous art. But where I do lie on the scale is if I'm looking at 15 other games, and they're all dungeon crawlers, and I have plenty of dungeon crawlers that do have miniatures, and I personally do like miniatures. Respect anyone who doesn't. That's fine. I'll do you do you. I like miniatures on my table in dungeon crawling experiences. But that does mean 
that when I sit there and look at a dungeon crawler that doesn't have miniatures, all I'm sitting there asking myself, well, should I pay attention to that one or should I just go for the ones that have miniatures and see if they're good? It's kind of like movies and CGI. I could absolutely enjoy a movie that doesn't have good CGI, good graphics, good whatever. I don't need, you know, explosions and action to make a movie good. But since I do like explosion and action, I'm going to pay attention more to the big blockbuster movies than the smaller ones. The difference is in movies, most movies that have that stuff are inherently bad. In board games, there are a lot of good games with miniatures that are very, very good. I'm going to go through these tiles here. Double-sided, amazing tiles. Not this end one, though, because these are probably the boss tiles, the end pits or whatnot. So, let's go ahead, going through the tiles here, because these are absolutely gorgeous. The art in Machina Arcana. And it's a shame I don't have the art book to show off over here. The art book would be fast, like amazing to show, because Machina Arcana is a game that, despite the standees over miniatures, has some of the best art I've seen in any in any board game. Absolutely riveting, especially if you're looking at it from the stance of like actually seeing the straight up art and not just the tiles. But the the game art is amazing as you go through this dungeon, as you turn gears, as you set off traps. You see these little tra tra uh, what do you call it grates over there? As you wander around to a location and turn that little wheel, it goes poof. And a whole bunch of monsters just go up in flames, which is awesome because the monsters are otherwise very difficult. And so being able to like do a, 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 an attack on them on a whole bunch of them at once as you lure them onto those traps is a lot of fun. This is a game I have not played in way too long. And then there's barrels, these exploding barrels that go boom. There's going to be the various workbenches and the, the chests that you can go ahead and grab stuff from. Do we have any workbenches here? I don't see any workbenches. Are these the workbenches? I don't remember. These are the chests. I know that. These are the scrolls. I don't think those are workbenches. Where are my workbenches? Or am I not remembering how workbenches work? It might be that... Oh, here we go. There we go. I knew I was doing this right. That over there is a workbench. So, we're going through these tiles, just looking at the various options, the sides, the, the places where you can manipulate and attach your gear to each other. I played on this tile. I remember this tile. Oh, yes, I remember. I remember going up the stairs, trying to run away from the monsters, having somebody run around there, and then go boom on that grate. Oh, my gosh. It is... It is such a good experience. I played on this tile, too. I recognize some of these specific tiles I've been on. Yeah, the game is... I mean, these tiles, they do a lot with these tiles. Every single tile has its own little puzzle of how you're going to survive. And then we have the boss scenarios, which this boss scenario, I've played against this boss scenario. I don't know if I've ever bothered the others because I haven't yet won the game, so I keep trying against this boss scenario over here. But that's the tiles. These are the tiles in Machina Arcana, the game that we have so far. Then we have the double layered player thingies. Double layered player thingies is the technical term. We have our, these are little double layered round tracker where we track all the stuff. And then we have these over here, which have our own individual character dashboards. You put your card in here, you have your little double layered stuff over there. These are the four characters you can play with. You can play with, um, I don't think I've ever played a true solo. I've played a two hand solo and I've played it with three. I've never played a true solo. And then we have some uh, sheets over here, which I assume various stuff go. Now, if we grab, if we grab, our rule book, our rule book, no, our learn to play, our learn to play had it maybe, here's our rules, I don't remember, let's take a look, it was in the back of something, it was not in the back of here, so it's in the back of the learn to play, but well, if you go here, you can see this shows you how everything lies down in your board, I'm not going to do that now, but that information is there, so if you're someone who gets your hand on a coffee, understand that you do have that information, you don't need to go to the forums, just go to the back of the learn to play book, and you'll have all that information, which brings us to what else do we have here? We have this board over here, which has this over here, which is just a placeholder for putting tokens in there. The tokens will go in that tray. We'll deal with that later. And then we have our cards. There's lots of cards, just a little bit all over the place over here. And those brutal, brutal, brutal dice that are not kind to anyone at all. And then we have our various player tokens and our various monster standees. We'll leave those in there. Those aren't interesting at all. And then we'll have some cards, which we'll go through, as well as a little bag over there. That's what we have in the base, base box. I almost said base gops. Now, Rakan Arcana is a game that I have not played in far too long. It's one of those games that I ranked really, really well. And many games that I rank well, most games that I rate well, do hit the table a lot. Because if I'm going to give a game a 4.5, a, a 4, a 5, if I'm not playing it again, then what does the rating really mean? Now, there are some interesting exceptions, like uh, Cthulhu Wars is an interesting exception where I gave it a 4. I actually kept it a while before ranking it because I, I was torn on it. But I gave Cthulhu Wars a 4. It's an excellent game. But it's in a genre, area control, in which I have plenty of 5s. So there are some exceptions where you, I do think a game is excellent, but I have too many games that are better in that genre. But let's use fives as the re reference point, because fives, for context, in my entire collection, 
I believe, in a I'm counting active games, not games I've since ranked or whatever, I actively have something like 35 games in my collection that I rank a 5. You'll see this if you subscribe to the channel, plug of there, subscribe to the channel, all that stuff. Uh, if you want to see my top 100, which I'll be doing this year, you'll see all of my 5s in there. It's going to be the top 35-ish or so, whatever it is. I don't think I'll be ranking them in the top 100, but I guess at some point I'll let you know when. But yeah, the top 35-ish in that list are my 5 out of 5s, games that I think are tremendous experiences that I absolutely adore, and they are, for the most part, games that I have played again and again. Again, there are a handful of exceptions there. There are some exceptions. There are games that I give a five and that I haven't played them in a long time. And that leads to my own questioning of myself. Like, I have the question. You may not. I certainly do. I have the question. Can a game be a five if it isn't being played actively? That's the question on the table. If I'm not playing it actively, and I do play a lot of games, I play like a thousand games a year, so I'm not getting certain fives played, what does that mean for the rating? And I don't have a firm answer. I don't yet. Part of the, for, to me, the question is why is it not getting played? If, in the case of Machina Arcana, I think the reason I haven't played Machina Arcana is because I think of Machina Arcana as a two player experience, but it plays well solo, but I don't actually pull it out solo. And it's one that I, I, the people I play this game with, my wife enjoys it, but doesn't love it. Uh, the other person in my group who I would play this with hasn't actually learned it yet. And uh, Shira played it as well, Shira on the channel. Um, she has played it as well, but not in a long time. She would not remember the rules at all, which means it's basically a game that I haven't exposed to the other person I primarily would play it with, and I don't think of it as a solo game, even though it is solo and I have played it solo, so it just hasn't hit the table. I need to mentally pivot to considering Machina Arcana a solo game, and then it will hit the table more often, or teach it to the person who I play these types of games with, and he will enjoy it immensely. He's my, like, my Zombicide and my Cthulhu Death May Die buddy and all that. Although Rena's technically my Cthulhu Death May Die buddy. He just also likes Cthulhu Death May Die, but doesn't play it enough, as much because I primarily play it with Rena. But that is, this is a specific genre of the dungeon crawling genre. These are games like uh, Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, which I've been playing solo. Yes, I put out a video a few weeks ago on 10 games I need to play or they're leaving. Jaws of the Lion was in there. I have since played like 7 games with Jaws of the Lion, so... By the time you watch this, who knows how many times I've played it, which is good because it promoted, it pushed me to play, it pushed me to play some games. Uh, Jaws of the Lion is the first one. I'm already halfway through the rules for Giant Killer Robots, so that's going to be the next one. Going through these games, trying to get them played, is part of the goal, absolutely. And sometimes it's, you get a game played because you want to get rid of it. You want justification to get rid of it, or you want confirmation as to whether it's a game for you. I've always said whether I like a game or not is if I love a game, it's a win. If I hate a game, or not hate, if I don't like a game, it's a win. The middle gray area for me has always been if I like a game, but because then I wrestle with myself, because then I want to keep it, I want to play it. But a three and a half, a three point five in my scale, even a three sometimes, I often want to keep them. Threes are good games, but I don't actually play them, which is the problem. So so that's where uh, games I love and games I don't love are totally fine. It's the middle zone that is a potential problem. Let's go through some of these weapons here, these gears. We have this anaplectic kit over here. Restore three health or restore six stamina or restore two essence. I'm not going to try to, uh, you know what, let me go ahead and put these down like that. Okay. Choose to restore two essence. Uh, gain an item, invoke experience event or invoke experience uh, thingy. Reduce monster threat by three. Ignore the thingy there. Skip horror phase. Yeah, skipping horror phase. That's big. Reducing the threat is big. These are some fun things you can do. Oh my gosh, what do we have here? What else do we have? I love the gear in this game. You can activate... Oh my gosh. You can activate action spaces as if you are adjacent to them. Okay, lots of app options or opportunities over there. Then we have banish target monster but spawn a monster. These gears are so... Control a monster. Skip the horror phase. When any unit is hit by one, attack loses health instead. Explorers trade with each other. Explorers use the inventory. These are just so many fun weapons and gear in this game. Like, gear in some games. Let's say Massive Darkness is a good example. The original Massive Darkness, most upgrades, gear, stats, all those things, mostly came down to just modifications to rolling different dice or more dice. It was very uninspiring. I like Massive Darkness as a system, but I didn't love... The, the fact that most stats came down to just dice, dice modifiers, which is just not exciting. Which is one of the reasons I was very excited when they announced Massive Darkness 2. But, this game. This game gives you actual fun gear that's not just stats. Granted, I'm about to show you the weapons. The weapons are the closest thing to just being just stats. We have Attack 1, Attack 2. Those are different dice. The better or the worst dice over there. We have, let's see if we can find one. 
Oh my gosh, see, like this is one. We have attacking, but also closing target door. So that gives you an option there to mess with things over here. We have, let's see, uh, you see, this is the kind of thing. We have switching positions with a unit. So you can go ahead and switch positions with a target unit. Again, there's lots of fun things you can do. We have, let's see, no, no, these are just attack modifications, they're fine. Um, we have, what do we have? We have arcane attack, then give an item to any explorer. Like a lot of these things just have tons of stuff that you can do where you can just mess with people in, in ways that we have rever rever reverberating glaive where you can attack it and if you hit, you can target a adjacent monster and equip this item as the main weapon. So let's see, just bounce around. When any adjacent monster is destroyed, restore health to any explorer. There's a lot of fun weapons over here that you can have. Lots of fun things. We haven't even gotten to the various uh, manipulations as far as, let's say, things like over here. What do we have over here on this one? We Oh, wait, no, I'm going to go this this pile. We have the Kalig Mortis. Move through spaces. Move through up to four passable or, or pit spaces that are adjacent to a wall. Let's you dance around the zone. When adjacent to a wall, increase your attacks. Then we have, when you're hit, push adjacent units. When you're hit, move a spot. Choose direction. Oh, wow, jet boots. I love it. Choose a direction and move until you hit an obstacle, rubble, or a wall. So again, these just give you things. I remember there's things like, like you just jump between walls. There's like so many fun gear in this game that completely messes with how you're going to do things. The least exciting things in the game is the attacking. It's all about the survival. Because this game has events. It has, what does it have? I'm trying to remember where these go. Where these go? These go over here, maybe. That looks like they hit there. I'm going to have to sleeve these. Okay, let's put these here. Let's put these over here. I don't know exactly how these go. We'll figure that out later. Yes, I know I have the manual thing I showed you. We have these cards over here. These are some of the bad effects that happen, I assume, or some of the good effects. There's going to be two piles, probably. We have the green. Are there two different piles here, or is it one pile? Here we go. Here's the other pile. We have the Abominable Blast. We had initially thought that should we keep enough distance between ourselves and the Eldritch Abominations, we just might be able to stay alive. We were wrong. They rallied themselves with a piercing cry with a came blast of cosmic energy intent on reducing us to piles of gore. Now we fight. There's no place to run and no place to hide. So these are both good and bad things that will happen to you in the game. I'm going to put these away for now while I figure out where they're supposed to go. Otherwise, we're going to put them down in here. Because why not? And we'll put you... What are these over here? These are, oh, these are the various monsters. So you have the various monsters in here. And again, we also have, of course, the expansions, which we haven't talked about yet. And then we have these cards, which are your various, uh, basically the stories that are happening, the events, the stories. You can put the cards together and have different sequences as you go through things, trying to accomplish different objectives, run around, activate this, do that, all that kind of stuff. And then we have the dice. Then we have the dice from Machina Arcana. But yeah. This is an excellent experience. It's a game that I need to dive into. Jaws of the Lion is first because I, I need to play that Jaws of the Lion just to prove that I will. And Jaws, by the way, is underneath this table as we speak. Really enjoying it. Uh, but Machina Arcana is something else. It's a very different experience. It is a intense survival in a very different way than Jaws. Uh, Jaws, or Gloomhaven in general, is a game that is all about... I'm going to put this back in here and figure things... Oh, that's just... that's just Yeah, sure, let's do that. Okay, let's see how we can do this here. This can go over here, these can go over here, this goes over here like so, this goes over here, I'll do this on camera so you can see this all, this goes over here, maybe something, we'll see. I'm not sure exactly how things go here, I'm just trying to figure it all out, hoping it all works. I know I have the thingy, but I'm not doing the proper uh, putting it away right now. Right now it's all about the general putting it away, I'll put the proper thing away, I lost a token, no! And we'll do that, and that is your core box unboxing and semi reboxing of the experience. Boom. Lock and Arcana. Great. Expansions. So, Jaws of the Lion. Jaws of the Lion is great, but it mostly comes down to staring intently at the board for five minutes and then trying to figure out what the best way to play cards is in a way that we will have you not dying as ideally as possible. Play the top of this card, the bottom of that card. It's a lot of tactical planning, but it's mostly the puzzle of trying to ensure you do what you need to do fast enough because you can't wait forever. You will eventually run out of either health or your cards and you'll die. Machina Arcana to Eternity. I don't remember which one was the new expansion in the Kickstarter, which was the old one. I don't remember. Okay. Because I never played with the expansions. So I don't have that memory locked in. We have these over here. We have the tokens. Uh, but yeah, that's basically Jaws. Jaws, we have more standees. We have more cards. More exciting cards. Okay, I'm going to go open the cards because I like, I like these cards. They're my favorite part. But 
Jaws is a repetitive tactical experience of survival that is a very excellent puzzle, but it is one that doesn't have the same vibe as, let's say, Machina Arcana. Now, I'm not saying I rank Machina Arcana higher or not. I need to play more Jaws first. But I, if I have to keep one right now, based on having like seven plays of Jaws in the past, you know, week, I think, whew, that's a hard one. I think I would keep Machina Arcana. I think so. Jaws is really good, but their gameplay is a little bit more repetitive. I really like the, the, the stuff here. Because the puzzle in, in Jaws of the Lion is all about your hand. It's all about managing your hand. The puzzle in Machina Arcana changes differently depending on what you have. Every single game is drastically different just depending on the gear you have. And you're never going to see all the gear. You're never going to see all the gear at once. So I think that the escalation or variability in Machina Arcana is better despite Jaws having so much content. But either way, okay, Abyssal Diviner. If adjacent to any, any space over there, take the top card from any item deck. When you attack two, you move a space. When both hands are unequipped, increase your armor and your will. Oh my gosh. You see, this is like, you can really craft an entirely different game, depending on what you have. Move up to eight spaces, increase your armor by three. Like, this stuff is insane. When you play a consumable, store three health. You can move through pits if they are adjacent to walls or obstacles. You have a, basically a, a, a spider backpack that's gripping walls to move you across a pit. They totally change the game. They let you run away from a monster. If you have that backpack, you can suddenly leave the monsters around the board, run away from them, side scroll off to the side, and suddenly leave a whole bunch of monsters dead in the game. This is They change the game. This is what I'm talking about. The sense of escalation you get from these cards is very different than the sense of escalation you get from a game like Jaws of the Lion. I like Jaws. I'm not talking smack about it. I had to pause for a good healthy moment before I said I'm going to keep Machina Arcana, but I think I would keep Machina Arcana. On new rounds, switch the position of any number of adjacent units. You can target adjacent ethereal units. That's interesting. I don't know. I'm sure it's impactful at the right time. I don't know it's majorly impactful. Lots of fun things over here. Destroy target map. <laughs> uh, Diatomic charge over here. Destroy target map tile. Now, it's a one-time use, but it's a bomb where you just go poof and destroy the map tile. And then I assume once you continue side scrolling, it comes back. But that is, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Every single one of these cards gives me a major aha moment in the game. I don't know how exciting the rest of this will be because we just basically have some characters. We have some monsters. Let's take a look at a character. I haven't shown you a character yet. But like not all these things are exciting. But they're more content. That's exciting. Okay, let's see if I can open this here. We got a card bend over there, which I don't love. You can't, you maybe you can see it over here. You can see over there that card bend. You can see it a little bit there. It's basically pre-bent in the plastic, which means I will have a slight bend. It's not a big deal. It won't change the game. It's a slight annoyance. But anyways, let's go ahead and scroll through this. Try to take this plastic off without adding to the card bend. See, I probably should look at that first because sometimes I do these openings of, of plastics and I don't notice it first. And I'm like, oh no, I wasn't careful enough and I caused the issue. And sometimes I didn't. Sometimes this was just came that way. Lorna Wallace. She is, when you are hit, you and adjacent explorer can upgrade or augment one item. So that's an interesting ability right there. Then we have Oglin Wallace. When you are hit, you and adjacent explorer can equip one main item. So again, we have these different options over here. On any horror event, re-invoke explorer event. So just different things you can do with these cards, different characters you have. And then I assume we have monsters as well. We have the Cthuga, we have the Envoy of Dagon, we have Spiders of Leng, we have Cho Cho. Cho Cho! Hey, I know Cho Cho from Cthulhu Wars, which I already mentioned in this video. See that's the thing about uh about about this um Cthulhu or Elder stuff. It's not it's not like Arkham Horror's property, it's not Command's property, it's open source, it's everyone's property. Which means anyone can make their games about it, and we have very different spins. Do you know how drastically different Arkham Horror or uh, Cthulhu Death May Die or Machina Arcana are? They're drastically different experiences in the feels they provide and the experiences they give you. I need to play Machina Arcana. Okay, new deal, new deal, okay? If I don't have Machina Arcana played in the next three months, in that same video, same time I was going to get rid of uh, um, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which I think is February's le games leaving the collection in February. If I have not played Machina Arcana, then it's also going away. Why am I saying that? Because I will, that will force me to get it played again. Although, I, and I got a comment from the video I did about the fact that I'm going to go through the gear. I'm sorry, I just like the gear. I got a comment in that video I did talking about the fact that they're saying, well, you know, it seems like you're really forcing yourself to play these games. It sounds like, and the person was like, 
I mean, they weren't, I'm saying it a little bit sarcastically because to me it's funny, but the person's point was actually reasonable. His point was, he's saying, it seems like you have to force yourself to play these games. Maybe you shouldn't be trying so hard. Maybe you'd be happier with having fewer games. And to that, I'll say a few different things. First of all, no. The answer is no there. I, the fact that I have to play these mind games myself to force myself to play some games is fine. And that's, that is a victim of the fact that I'm doing a lot of content, a lot of games, a lot of coverage. I have a lot of games. So yes, sometimes these games have to be played. But, and bear with me here, anyone who has a job or kids and has long days, sometimes you get to the end of a day and you just aren't in the mood of playing a game. That happens. It absolutely happens. It happens to a lot of you. I don't know if it happens to all of you, but it happens to a lot of you. And sometimes you sit there and say to yourself, no, I'm going to play this game anyway. And when you do that, I believe, and I could be wrong here, I believe it happens to none of you that you regret that time. Sometimes you have to push yourself to do things you want to do. This is evidence. And sometimes it's easy to do the things we don't want to do. Have you ever sat there on your phone in bed at night, scrolling through Facebook, looking for one more thing to distract you? Do you want to do that? I assume no for most of you. Do you still sometimes do that? I assume yes for a good chunk of you. That's true in life in general. Sometimes the things we, that are easy to do are not the things we want to do. And sometimes the things we want to do are not the things that are easy to do. So yes, playing games, pushing yourself, that's all a factor. One of the reasons I log my plays, I talked about this a while ago. One of the reasons I log my plays is exactly that conversation. I like the mental mind game of... I want to get more plays in. Oh, I need to do a 14 by 14 challenge. I need to play 14 games 14 times. Why am I challenging and pushing myself? Because sometimes you can push yourself to do things and it gives you that additional incentive to do the thing that you already wanted to do. I have never regretted a single... That's not true. Some games are bad. I have never regretted spending time playing games. Sometimes I've regretted the game I chose playing. That's a different story entirely. But sometimes you have to play these games and that's okay. I will play these games because it means I'll end up playing Machina Arcana. Do you think I regret these seven games I've played of Jaws of the Lion under this table? I do not. They are all fantastic. I will not regret playing Machina Arcana either. So yeah, if this game isn't played by February 2022, this game is leaving my collection. It's not going anywhere. I'm going to play it. Okay, we have Labored Stilts. You are not affected by triggered traps. We have that one's not as interesting, not as interesting. You are not affected by exploding barrels. That could be really useful. When you block, you can lose one charge to reduce the attack roll to zero. Again, could be very useful. When adjacent to rubble, you are ethereal. You cannot be targeted by physical attacks. That is beautiful. I love these cards. You can move through obstacles with the Ornithopter. When you are wounded, increase your attack rolls by one. Okay, what do we have? Skip the horror phase. When you spawn a monster, you can lose one charge to restore two essence. This is a game of survival. Gain all abilities from target monster. I'm telling you, these cards are just fun. They're just a lot of fun. A lot of game-breaking stuff as you find and equip new gear. Machina Arcana is a delightful puzzle of survival. You will not survive if you go head-to-head -head with the various beasts in front of you. You have to play these games. You have to sit there and try to get the right gear, try to level up, try to explode a barrel, trigger a trap, run around, run to the next map tile, explode a map tile with a giant bomb situation. This game is so ridiculously good. The reason I said yes to it is because they reached out to me. When they had their Kickstarter, uh, basically they reached out to me. I, I, I had seen the Kickstarter and I was like, eh, it doesn't have miniatures, looks cool, but I mean, there's a lot of these games. This one is not special. They reached out to me. I'm so glad and grateful that they did because it's such a good game. It is so, it's so good. Now I just need to play it more. Anyways, that's been your unboxing. This is your unboxing and rambling. There was a decent amount of rambling. I was all over the place today. That's okay. I like it better that way. It's more fun. But anyways... For me, not perhaps not for you. Some of you, yes, but perhaps not for all of you. Anyways, Machina Arcana, this was your uh, unboxing and rambling. I don't know when this video goes up. I rarely do when it comes to these. I'm going to go check my phone because if someone got back to me, then I'm off to play Mind MGMT with someone else. So we'll see how that goes. In any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.